Since time immemorial, plants and fungi have proven to be one of Homo sapiens' greatest resources, not just as sustenance, but as a fount of healing medicine, spiritual inspiration, and mystery. Humans do not merely utilize these species for these purposes, but are intrinsically involved in the cultural knowledge surrounding them, their domestication, and safekeeping. Imagine a world without painkillers, antibiotics, anticoagulants, anti-malarial medicines, or some chemotherapies, all of which have been either directly derived from, synthesized, or inspired by plants and fungi. And who would want to live in a world without the mystery and magic of poison-tipped arrows or hallucinogens? In Plants of the Gods podcast, renowned ethnobotanist Dr. Mark Plotkin who has worked in and on the Amazon for almost four decades studying the relationship between humans and plants, takes his listeners on an inspiring journey from the most remote corners of Amazonia to other exotic locales. Learn about the fascinating history and uses of the plants of knowledge and power, like the hallucinogenic snuffs of the Yanomamo tribe, Tacoca, from which cocaine is derived, the ayahuasca liana, from which a hallucinogenic brew is produced, or the diverse formulations of curare, a plant mixture which relaxes the muscles of the body and leads to asphyxiation. Not only will you better understand what we know about these sacred species and how we use them, but how they are revolutionizing Western medicine while the fight is on to protect these healing species and the people who know them best. This and more from Plants of the Gods with Dr. Mark Plotkin. Now, in this podcast, I want to do something different. I want to talk about wine and the wine grape as one of the plants of the gods. This is seldom the case. In Schulte's and Hoffman's classic book, The Plants of the Gods, there's no mention of wine. Wine is seldom uh, included in discussions of mind-altering substances, and I think that's a big mistake. In fact, if you ask people to guess the most commercially valuable medicinal plant in the world, uh, the answers you get would probably be opium or cannabis, or even ginseng. But frankly, the correct answer is the wine grape, which generates more than 300 billions in global annual revenue. It's not only one of our most ancient drinks and ancient plants of the gods, it represents the first recorded medicine. Based on a tablet at Nippur in Iraq, it's the first biological medical prescription carved in stone, carved on a cuneiform tablet. Now, wine is not only a beverage. It's also served as an analgesic, an antiseptic, a menstruum, which is a liquid into which plants are placed, which extracts their vital essence. It's a soporific. It puts people to sleep. It's a valuable economic commodity, and it's a water purifier, a social lubricant, and even an inspiration. Wine, in fact, I regard as the ultimate creative juice, and I'm not alone. According to Horace, one of the poet laureates of ancient Rome, no poem was ever written by a drinker of water. In fact, I'm going to argue that wine and the wine grape has played a greater role in the evolution of human society than any other plant besides the cereal grains like rice or wheat. Now, I was once asked if I could give a lecture on the history of wine and the wine grape and its role in the evolution of human culture. That's covering thousands of years. And I was told I had to do it in 20 minutes. And I said, I can do it in two sentences. The Greek historian Thucydides wrote, the peoples of the Mediterranean began to emerge from barbarism when they learned to cultivate the olive and the vine. A couple of thousand years later, the great writer William Faulkner put it even more succinctly, civilization begins with distillation. We still tend to associate the beginnings of wine culture with the Greeks and the Romans of the ancient Mediterranean world. This is incorrect, I think, both biologically and historically. Not only did catching a buzz from alcohol found in fermented fruits not originate in the greco roman world of 2,000 years ago, but the custom didn't even begin with our own species. When I mentioned to Jane Goodall, an old friend of mine, about the origins of wine in the Caucasus, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, she pointed out that alcohol consumption began in the animal kingdom long before the rise of our own species. 
Fermented fruits are in fact consumed by insects like bees, butterflies, fruit flies, birds, and mammals as diverse as bats, elephants, howler monkeys, tree shrews, and Jane Goodall's famous chimps of Gombe. Undoubtedly, a complete list of animals which enjoy altered states induced by alcohol fermented fruit would be much, much longer. The research remains to be done. Now, the fermentation of sugars from many sources can yield an alcoholic drink, but I want to focus on the wine grape. Wine has been made from dates, wine has been made from many fruits, but it's that wine grape, that famous wine grape, native to Eurasia, which is the source of most of our wine today. Now, ancient humans may have been consuming naturally fermented grape juice throughout Eurasia for thousands of years, but the archaeological evidence clearly points to Transcaucasia, a region comprised of what is today the countries of Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and adjacent Iran and Turkey as the place where humans first began to purposefully and systematically plant grapes and process them into wine. The oldest extant proof of wine production are pottery shards of vats that once held wine, which were excavated in the Republic of Georgia. This research was done by my pal, Dr. Patrick McGovern of the Penn Museum in Philadelphia, who is the leading authority on the production of wine in the ancient world. McGovern and his colleagues date the manufacture of wine to about 8,000 BCE. Other jars employed for wine storage were found in northwestern Iran, dated as far back as 5000 BCE. And again, this is a tribute to the incredible advances in technology where we can scrape the bottom of these old wine vats and analyze what was in them. Not just that it was wine, but were other plants which were used to either preserve the wine or add different flavors. Now, one of the most interesting finds is that at the Iranian site, they found that it not only contained wine made from the wine grape, but also a plant resin extracted from the terebinth tree of the genus Pistachio. This genus appears repeatedly in the Bible. Indeed, it's the so-called balm of Gilead, which is supposed to have been derived from these same trees. Terebinth resin was valued for its decay-fighting properties, so much so that it was employed by the Egyptians in the mummification process. A major challenge for winemakers in the old days has been to keep the fruit sugars, which the yeast turn from the sugar in the grape into alcohol, and then bacteria convert the alcohol to vinegar. So what these winemakers wanted was to get the fruit sugars turned into alcohol, but to stop the process which then turned it into vinegar. Now, they couldn't have understood the underlying chemical processes, but the winemakers of ancient Persia and elsewhere in the region were using a natural product to kill unwanted microorganisms, a practice which anticipates the research of Louis Pasteur and Alexander Fleming that revolutionized medicine 6,000 years later. So in other words, they're using the sap of the terebinth tree to kill the bacteria that turned wine into vinegar. So this is clearly a case of one of the first antibiotics, even if they couldn't understand the chemistry which underlay what they were trying to do. Now, one wonders why wine cultivation began in Transcaucasia, because I said the wine grape was found in Eurasia, which is that great land mace that extends from the Atlantic all the way across to uh, the Pacific. And Transcaucasia has long been a crossroads of many cultures. It's bracketed by two seas, the Black Sea to the west and the Caspian Sea to the east, meaning that it was a crossroads of trade. The legend of Jason and the Golden Fleece, which recounts the Argonauts sailing east from Greece to the land of Colchis, which we know as the Republic of Georgia, was to the Greeks the limits of the known world. This legend likely represents a retelling of the Greeks' initial meeting with the Georgians, and they may have come away with the Golden Fleece, but in all probability they came away with new grape cultivars and the additional knowledge of how to best cultivate grapes and process them into wine. This is an interesting case of biology explaining some of what we think as pure legend. Now, wine quickly became a symbol of wealth in Mesopotamia. The historical record does not move directly from Georgia to Greece. 
Ironically, wine appears next in the historical record where the wine grape did not grow or thrive, in the hot and dry deserts of Mesopotamia. In fact, the first depiction of wine drinking is featured on a Sumerian panel dated 2600 BC. This artwork, known as the Standard of Ur, now on display in the British Museum, portrays a king seated on a carved stool while being toasted by six attendees holding wine cups. That wine had to be transported from far away, that it was safer and tastier to drink than water, that it induced altered states, and that it could be employed for curative purposes made it the preferred drink of local royalty. It became the drink of royalty, in my opinion, in the opinion of others like McGovern and Tom Standage, uh, is that it required massive labor and expense to be produced in a challenging environment. Let's talk about the early use of wine as a medicine and why I consider it a plant of the gods. Remember at the time, there really weren't many plants that induce altered states. Today, we have marijuana, we have wine, we have hard liquor. Uh, All of these are legal things at our fingertips that induce altered states. But in the ancient world, these plants were not ubiquitous. So the one or two plants that you had access to that could enhance creativity, that could relax you, that could inspire you, were greatly prized. The earliest known record of wine employed as a medicine, as I said at the outset, also comes from ancient Sumer. This documentation features what is widely regarded as the world's oldest medical prescription and therefore is the oldest recorded use of a plant to the gods. Therefore, we think that use of wine for medicinal purposes is likely as ancient as wine itself. A cuneiform tablet from the ancient city of Nippur in the Iraqi desert, dated 2200 BCE, contains detailed accounts of various prescriptions, many consisting of salves created from crushed plants, some of which are infused by wine. One translated prescription appears in my late colleague uh, Salvatore Lucia's classic book, A History of Wine as Therapy. He said, pound together dried wine dregs, juniper, prunes, beer, and rub the diseased parts with oil and bind on a plaster. Now, the disease not being treated is not specified, but the external application of the mixture probably indicates that it's for a wound or an infection. The alcohol in the beer was poured onto the mixture may have had a mild antibacterial effect. The Sumerians were notably passionate about beer, brewing at least 19 different varieties. More important from a therapeutic standpoint was the wine. Grape wine has been proven to contain several antibiotic compounds. In other words, all alcohol kills bacteria, but wine is much more effective at doing so than beer. And I'll cover the ethnobotany of beer in a later podcast. Now, famous in the annals of medical history is physician John Snow's study of the 1854 Broad Street cholera outbreak in London, which led us to the causation uh, by microbes. Less widely celebrated was an 1892 paper by the Austrian military physician Pick that constituted the first scientific demonstration of wine's antiseptic antibiotic properties. Like Snow four decades before him, Pick noticed who did, and more importantly, who did not get sick during the cholera epidemic, this time in Paris. Noting that wine drinkers did not contract the deadly disease, Pick carried out a simple experiment. He mixed both cholera and typhoid bacteria with wine and observed that the microbes expired, leading to a host of subsequent experiments yielding similar results. My late colleague Guido Magno, who wrote the book The Healing Hand, which is the best book on the history of medicine, said, and I quote, The antiseptic power of wine is no myth, since it cannot depend on alcohol alone, Research has pinned down the mechanism is anthrocyanins, a subgroup of the large group of polyphenols present in wine. The more important member of this group of compounds as regards to antibacterial effects is also the principal pigment of red wines, melvicide or enocide. There's a colorless equivalent for white wines. 
This pigment is already present in grapes, but combined with a carbohydrate and not antiseptic during alcoholic fermentation, it splits free and becomes activated, which shows that this ancient use of wine as a medicine four or 5,000 years ago in the ancient Middle East was right on the money. Observations in Paris at the end of the 19th century therefore confirmed the effectiveness of wine as an antibacterial, a property documented more than 4,000 years ago, but undoubtedly employed earlier than that. To purchase Dr. Mark Plotkin's new book, The Amazon, What Everyone Needs to Know, or his first book, Tales of a Shaman's Apprentice, visit your local bookseller or order from Amazon.com. From Mesopotamia, the wine culture moved west to the land of Canaan. The Canaanites were a Semitic people who inhabited much of the ancient Near East. Canaan itself usually refers to what is known as the Southern Levant, which was centered on Lebanon, but also included portions of what are today Israel, Jordan, Palestine, and Western Syria. Lebanon in particular, with its greater precipitation, higher elevation, better soils, proved ideal for viticulture compared to the flat, parched, and sandy landscapes that comprise much of Mesopotamia. A group of enterprising Canaanites centered on coastal cities like Byblos, Sidon, and Tyre, as well as the fertile, the fertile Baca Valley to the east, developed an extraordinary maritime culture focused on trade rather than conquest. These coastal Canaanites later became known as the Phoenicians and appear in ancient sources as varied as Homer, Herodotus, Egyptian term paintings, and even the Bible. Now, three ethnobotanical products, three ethnobiological products, I should say, two botanical, the other zoological, played fundamental roles in this seafaring development. The cedars of Lebanon were once the largest and most majestic trees in the entire Middle East. They also produce a magnificent wood, beautiful to behold, easy to work, fragrant, and decay resistant. The cedar enabled the Phoenicians to build the biggest and strongest ships of their day, so much so, much so that for the first time in Mediterranean history, people were able to sail across the open sea instead of just hugging the shore. The wood was in such demand that it was employed as far afield as Israel to build Solomon's temple and Egypt to build Khufu's colossal funerary ships. And if you haven't seen these funerary ships that were buried with the Pharaoh, check it out on the internet. It's really something to behold. They're now preserved in the Pyramid Museum and is something not to be missed. Another product that helped make the Phoenicians the masters of the Mediterranean commercial trade was their near monopoly on Tyrian purple, a spectacular red-purple dye made from the secretions of predatory murex sea snails of the genus Haustellum and Hexaplex. So closely identified were they with this valuable committee commodity that the name Phoenician is in fact derived from the Greek word phoinux, which means purple red. The dye quickly became the preferred pigment for royal and sacred robes throughout the region, making it by weight more valuable than gold. The Phoenicians introduced viticulture and winemaking to northern Africa, Algeria, Egypt, and to Europe, France, Greece, Italy, Portugal, and Spain. In so doing, they disseminated grapes believed to include varietals still prized in Europe. So valued was the Phoenician knowledge of wine that when the Romans sacked Carthage, which was originally a Phoenician colony on the northern coast of Africa, near today what we would call Tunisia, the army was instructed to be sure to save the 28 books of Mago, who had written classic works on agriculture, including some of the earliest texts on viticulture and viniculture. Supremely ironic is that although the Phoenicians invented the precursor of the modern alphabet, little of their writing survived today. While the Mesopotamians inscribed their records in cuneiform script on clay tablets, the Phoenicians, like the Egyptians, wrote on papyrus, which is developed from a plant. In the dry desert climate inside the Egyptian tombs, these papers survived, but in the more humid coastal climes of the Levant, they did not. Even the works of Mago, 
which were rescued and brought to Rome, where they were translated into both Greek and Latin, have disappeared and are known only through citations by Roman writers. Notably, no documentation exists with respect to the Phoenicians' possible employment of wine for medicinal purposes. In the absence of written accounts, however, significant advances in underwater archaeology, particularly side-scanning radar and deep-sea submersibles, are yielding abundant information about the wine culture of the Phoenicians and other citizens of the ancient world. Previous finds were made by sponge divers and scuba divers who were working in depths of less than 100 feet. Over the past three decades, however, astonishing find of Phoenician shipwrecks off the coast of southeastern Spain, Israel, and Malta are revealing information on international trade, shipbuilding techniques, and even wine composition. These wrecks typically contain numerous amphorae, which are the Canaanite jars, so-called, because they were invented by the Canaanites and contained uh, enormous amounts of wine. And some of these shipwrecks contain thousands and thousands and thousands of amphorae. Advances in human and plant genetics are also providing better understanding of the physician, the Phoenicians and their wine. Scientists now believe that they can demonstrate that the Phoenicians were growing grapes that originated in the Caucasus and that some of Europe's major grape varieties originated in Canaan. Genetic analysis of human remains has already advanced to the point that researchers can distinguish between Egyptians and Phoenicians in their tombs, even in individuals that perished 2,500 years ago. Further progress in underwater technology and genetics will continue to illuminate our understanding of these ancient peoples and their wines. Now, the story then moves to ancient Egypt, where a taste for wine was inculcated thousands of years ago. Wine and winemaking are depicted on obelisks, papyri, sculptures, and in vividly colored and evocative tomb paintings. One early wine lover was the famous King Scorpion I, whose tomb from 3500 BC contained 700 jars of wine that are believed to have been imported from the Eastern Mediterranean, including what is now Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, and Palestine. Laboratory analysis by Pat McGovern and his team have demonstrated that Scorpion's wine not only contained the terebinth resin, which I said was developed to fight off bacteria, but they also contained balm, coriander, mint, savory, and sage. These are all medicinal plants. So these are herbs that may have been added to improve the flavor of the wine, to retard the spoilage of the wine, or to magnify their healing properties, since all are used for therapeutic purposes. As was the case in Mesopotamia, the Egyptians found that most of their territory was unsuitable for growing grapes, but they did determine that grapevines would flourish in the fertile soils of the Nile Delta, where viticulture was established about, I would say, 3000 BCE. Similar to the situation in Mesopotamia, because production was limited, wine in Egypt remained primarily the drink of the pharaohs and other members of the ruling classes while the masses drank beer. As a preferred beverage of the king, the priests, and leading officials, winemaking became a celebrated activity which is why it appeared in so many tomb pictographs and paintings. Winemaking is vividly illustrated in pictographs within the tomb of Tahotep, a vizier and philosopher whose writings live on, his advice lives on, and famous paintings are found in the tomb of Nacht, N-A-K-H-T, who was an astronomer and priest who was laid to rest surrounded by strikingly colorful depictions of grape cultivation and harvesting. And it's really worth getting on the internet and checking out these incredible tomb paintings. Numerous medical papyri have survived. Papyrus like the Cahoon papyrus, the Edwin Smith papyrus, the Ebers papyrus, which are full of medical prescriptions, many of which contain wine as a key component. And once again, the Egyptians are mixing these healing herbs with the wine, 
which probably has the effect of A, retorting spoilage due to bacteria, which keeps the bacteria from turning the wine into vinegar, and also to enhance the taste, and also to enhance the healing properties. The most famous pharaoh of ancient Egypt also looms large in wine history. King Tut, Tutankhamun, was entombed in 1330 BCE with 36 amphora of wine to accompany him in the afterlife. His funereal wine cellar included both red and white wine, and 26 of the jars are labeled with the name of the winemaker, the location of the vineyard, and the year of production, not unlike the wines of today, and proof that a royal winemaking industry was flourishing. Not only was wine employed because of its efficiency in dissolving many of the active principles of plants, it also served to mask the bitterness of some of the herbs. In other words, in some cases, we think that these herbs were added to improve the taste of the wine. In some cases, some of these herbs are bitter because many healing herbs are bitter. And so uh, the wine would have masked the taste of the medicine. And not all of the unpleasant, purportedly therapeutic compounds added to wine were derived solely from plants. Egyptians treated epilepsy by adding to their wine ground donkey testicles. Let's talk about wine in, in other religious texts. The medical lore described in the five books of Moses draw heavily on Egyptian therapeutic traditions. Remember that Moses was said to have been raised in the palace of the pharaohs, so he would have learned much of Egyptian medicine. The Old Testament, which we now believe was written about 400 BCE, repeatedly mentions medicinal uses of wine, including its mixture with olive oil and balsam as a wound dressing. One of the sayings of Lemuel is to, quote, give wine unto those that be heavy of heart. A plan of the God, it raises you from depression, implying that it serves as a mood enhancer, while another verse states, let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more, suggesting its value as both a mood enhancer and a sedative. The Psalms state that, quote, wine maketh glad of the heart. The Talmud declares that wine is beneficial for treating problems of the heart, eyes, and bowels, and possibly as a treatment for impotence. In it, a piece of bread is soaked in wine as applied to infected eyes. Once again, wine as an anti-infective. The Talmud also claims that wine is, quote, taken in moderation, induces appetite, is beneficial to health. Wine is the foremost of all medicines. Wherever wine is lacking, other medicines become necessary. Wine and wine grapes are mentioned more often than any other plant in the Bible, so much so that in the Oxford Guide to Wine, it's written, quote, the Bible is not suitable reading for teetotalers. In the book of Genesis, Noah plants a vineyard as soon as the flood subsides and becomes the first person to produce wine, later becoming inebriated. Nonetheless, the implication, as was the statement of Thucydides that I gave earlier, was that viticulture represents progress in the development of culture. Wine has also served multiple purposes in Jewish religion and culture, Every major event in modern Judaism, from the birth to the death, from weddings to holidays, entails the drinking of wine. In The Story of Wine, which is a classic account written by the wine historian Hugh Johnson, he said, quote, Jewish devotion to wine runs through their law and their literature. It is the very essence of their civilization, end of quote. One example, not only is wine served at circumcision ceremonies, the so-called bris, but it is also applied to the incision to prevent infection, and the newborn is sometimes orally dosed with a few drops as an analgesic. Let's talk a bit about wine culture in ancient Greece, where people mistakenly believe the whole wine story starts, as we've seen it began much, much earlier. Wine has been described as the touchstone of ancient Greek civilization. So central was it to their cultural identity. In their view, truly civilized people, that is the view of the ancient Greeks, truly civilized people spoke Greek and drank wine. Ignorance of both the Greek language and of viticulture, especially by cultures that favored beer, was regarded as the hallmark of barbarians and savages. As both a drink and a libation, 
Wine served as a key component in Greek rituals and rites of passage, including burials, marriages, sacrifice, and especially the worship of the wine god Dionysus. It was not only enjoyed for its own sake, but also served as a dietary, religious, and economic staple, a driving force in the colonization of much of the Mediterranean. In a mountainous country with little arable land and no major rivers, the seafaring Greeks looked elsewhere to develop trade while expanding their wine culture further afield. So wine fueled a significant portion of the spread of what we consider Western civilization which is why I think wine has to be included in our list of plants of the gods. It featured as a centerpiece in the famous symposium, a word originally meaning drinking together, which is one of the most vital and noteworthy social events in ancient Greece. A symposium was a convivial wine-centered feast at which a range of topics were debated, discussed, and developed. Standage, Uh, an author of a classic book on the importance of beverages and civilization, described the process as rational inquiry through adversarial discussion, which helped lay the foundation for aspects of Western law, medicine, philosophy, and science. Both Plato and Xenophon recount discussions at symposia they attended, and depictions of these drinking parties are common illustrations on Greek vases, particularly from the 5th century BCE. An enduring aspect of Greek culture is their system of medicine, which codified and systematized and developed knowledge of health and healing. As was the case with the previous cultures that I mentioned, wine played a prominent role. Although Hippocrates is regarded as the father of medicine, the first detailed accounts of ancient Greek medicine were sung by a blind poet, Homer himself. Almost 150 wounds are mentioned in the Iliad and the Odyssey, and considerable knowledge of medical practice featured in both. Such detailed understanding and insight regarding wounds and treatments does Homer display that some have suggested that he may also have been a physician, and wine represents the medicine most frequently mentioned in both of these epics. The Greek warriors in the Odyssey always carry with them wine, water, and grain. And they're not the only consumers of wine in this work. The Trojans also drink wine, as does the Cyclops. Born 100 years after Homer, during the epoch of classical Greece, Hippocrates remains respected and revered more than 2,000 years later for launching the scientific study and treatment of disease. He essentially represents the first major figure in the history of medicine to develop an empiric approach rather than attribute disease and or healing solely to the spirit world. One of his most famous dictums was that, quote, natural forces within us are the true healers of disease. In other words, the human body is, and to a large extent, is self-regulating and self-healing, usually requiring only a bit of assistance in terms of exercise, fresh air, judicious use of medicine, and an optimal diet of which Hippocrates insists wine is an important component. He also recommended wine as preventative medicine regarding regular consumption as a key to good health. Hippocrates employed wine for the treatment of many different ailments, including as a diuretic, a febrifuge, and for ailments as diverse as anxiety, eye pain, ulcers, and head wounds. In one famous passage attributed to him, he wrote, quote, No wounds should be moistened with anything other than wine. Hippocrates was one of the first to write that different wines had different therapeutic properties, that, you know, things like sweet white wines were diuretics, while tannin-rich red wines were anti-diuretic. In his History of Wine as Therapy, physician Salvatore Lucia wrote, Hippocrates made no extravagant claims for wine, but incorporated it into the regimen for almost all acute and chronic diseases, and especially during the period of convalescence as well. Now, Hippocrates' esteemed contemporaries, Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates, all commented on the value and uses of wine. Of the three, Aristotle probably knew the most about the medicinal uses of wine, as he was educated by his father, Nicomachus, who served as court physician to the king of Macedon. 
Amentus III. In turn, Aristotle's most esteemed pupil was Alexander the Great, the greatest warrior of the ancient world. Every general is concerned for the welfare of his or her troops, if for no other reason than to be able to heal their wounds and send them back into battle. Undoubtedly, Aristotle, as the greatest polymath of his day, would have learned from his father of the medicinal value of wine and would have passed his wisdom on to his pupil, Aristotle. The next great figure in the history of wine, in medicine in particular, was Theophrastus, who was a pupil, colleague, and eventual successor of Aristotle. He's often deemed, quote, the father of botany because he wrote the first extensive treatise on plants covering plant structure, growth, and reproduction. Known in the English-speaking world as, quote, inquiry into plants, or in Latin as Historia Plantarum, it featured detailed descriptions of many species, both native and foreign, with accounts of their use. The book had an effect on botany and medicine for almost 20 centuries, meaning it was probably the most important book on plants or plants of the gods ever written. Theophrastus described the utility of many medicinal plants, including opium, which we'll cover in a future podcast. Many of these plants were decocted in wine with special emphasis on aromas, a sort of early account of aromatherapy. He further recorded the perfumed use of wines, the use of perfume wines, and their effect on the sense of taste. Theophrastus made enduring contributions to viticulture. He wrote about the effects of terroir and the conditions for planting, as well as the methods of both grafting and pruning. So let's move from Greece to Rome. Greek civilization and wine culture massively impacted the Romans. Educated Romans were expected to speak Greek as a second language and knew the Iliad and the Odyssey as some now know the Bible or the Quran. The Roman Empire drew heavily on Greek architecture, art, coinage, drama, literature, philosophy, religion, warfare, and in particular, in particular, medicine and viticulture. The cultivation and consumption of grapes and wine tightly linked the cultures of ancient Greece and ancient Rome. The questions of who the Romans were and whether they knew wine grapes cultivated prior to the arrival of grapes on the Italian peninsula intricately intertwined. As mentioned, the Greeks had colonized southern Italy as early as the 8th century BCE. Recent genetic analysis has demonstrated the inhabitants of the Roman Empire, particularly the Italian peninsula, were a mixture of Italian tribes, groups like the Etruscans, the Oscans, and the Samnites, as well as relative outsiders like the Greeks, the Anatolians, or, or Turks, and the Iranians. Now, Brian Murarescu, who has recently published a terrific book on the ancient Mediterranean, noted that the original inhabitants of the Italian peninsula were probably cultivating grapes and making wine in a relatively desultory fashion prior to the 8th century BC, but it was in all likelihood the Greeks who introduced a culture of viticulture. And I want to point out, in terms of Plants of the Gods, that Murarescu has done extraordinary research in revealing that some of the wine being drunk in the Roman Empire contained hallucinogenic plants, that some of the wine being drunk in early Christian rituals contained hallucinogenic plants and fungi, like ergot, which we'll be talking to in a future pine podcast, may have turbocharged their beliefs and their belief system, that the beliefs of the ancient Romans, like the famous uh, Eleusinian mysteries depicted in murals in Pompeii, and that even the early Eucharist containing these plants and fungi of the gods may have created a much more profound uh, experience for the consumers of this wine. Now, such a theory may be a bit uh, controversial. It's still playing out. But the archaeological evidence, uh, the archaeobotanical evidence, the archaeoethnobotanical evidence is indisputable. And I hardly recommend this book as a deep dive into this question.
Now, Stuart Fleming, who was an author of a classic work on Roman wine, pointed out that wine was truly a central element in Roman everyday life. It wasn't just something one enhanced a meal or gave zest to a party. It was central to Roman overseas trade policies and political interactions with the peoples of their provinces. It was an integral part of healthcare practices and religious practices as well. Once again, the Romans regard it as a plant of the gods. The next great figure in the history of medical wine was Dioscorides, who was a Greco-Roman physician who served in Nero's army, who traveled widely throughout the empire. The Romans were ethnobotanical opportunists, always looking for new and important plants to bring into cultivation or to add to their wine or to add to their therapeutic armamentarium. So when the Romans were fighting in a part of Holland, which we know as Frisia, the Frisians used a plant to fight off scurvy, and it turns out that this plant is rich in vitamin C. So once again, these ancient unleaded, unlettered people had figured out chemistry in a way which we came to much later. Together with the works of Theophrastus and Pliny, Dioscorides' work was the principal authority on botany and medicine for over 1,500 years. It was written in Greek, later translated into Latin and Arabic, and finally in 1665 into English. The book De Materia Medica on medicinal compounds was a major influence on botany and medicine in both the Christian and the Islamic world, and is considered one of, if not the, uh, most important and widely read book uh, for thousands of years. His enduring genius was to turn medical botany into applied science. He recommended the use of wine for a wide range of illnesses, including cardiac ailments, disorders of the digestive system, and respiratory problems. Like Hippocrates, he specified which wine was to be taken for which malady, carefully distinguishing between the effects of old, new, dry, and sweet wines. Dioscorides went so far as to recommend therapeutic uses for other parts of the grapevine, including the flowers, the leaves, the stalks, and the tendrils. Although many of his works survive, it's believed he authored a book on wine, which has been lost. The final figure I want to mention in the podcast uh, in terms of Roman wine is Pliny the Elder. He was a contemporary of Dioscorides. He was both a scholar and an army and a native Navy commander. Beginning around the year 70 CE, Pliny attempted to combine all known knowledge into a 37-book encyclopedia, Naturalis Historia, including everything from astronomy to zoology. Although he was for the most part more of a compiler than a researcher, he claimed to have drawn information from over 2,000 treatises written by nearly 500 Greeks and Romans, and many of that information and those references have been lost otherwise. He was a strong believer in the use of wine for therapeutic purposes. The 14th book of his encyclopedia focuses almost exclusively on wine. Book 17 contains considerable information on viticulture, while volume 23 is devoted to the medical uses of wine. He knew wine well. He mentioned 200 grape varieties, 500 types of Roman wines, 38 kinds of foreign wines, 18 varieties of sweet wines, and seven varieties of salted wines, because Romans mix seawater uh, with some of their wines, a use which has fortunately died out. He was such an investigator, such a devoted scientist, when he heard about the eruption of nearby Vesuvius, he summoned a boat and went to examine the eruption at closer range and in the hopes of rescuing a family friend. He died in the eruption. Much of what we know about Roman wine culture has been learned through the excavation of Pompeii and nearby sites like Herculaneum. The eruption of Vesuvius ironically simultaneously destroyed and preserved these towns. The Roman devotion to wine is depicted in numerous and memorable paintings and mosaics of grapes, wine, vineyards, and the wine god Bacchus. The ruins brim with the remains of vineyards, wine presses, wine vats, and wine jugs, the amphorae I mentioned earlier. 
Pompeii served as an epicenter of trade in wine, shipped both to and from many corners of the empire. The town and its environs served as Rome's principal source of wine, due in no small part to the rich and productive volcanic soil. So passionately devoted were the Pompeians to their favorite beverage that many of the houses were decorated with figures of Bacchus. One particularly poignant painting in the House of the Centenary features Bacchus dressed in grapes standing next to Vesuvius, whose slopes are covered in grapevines. In other words, they were growing uh, grapes all the way up the volcano. Much of what we know about the how and, and the where of grapevines planted in ancient Pompeii is due to brilliant ethnobotanical detective work by the late Wilhelmina Joshemsky. She removed the volcanic debris that covered, uh, that filled cavities created when the roots decayed and filled them with cement. She was thus able to determine precisely which crops had been planted and at which location. Her research proved that grapes were cultivated throughout the town of Pompeii, not just around it, and included at least one sizable vineyard with over 2,000 grapevine root cavities within the confines of the city itself, on a plot of land that had previously believed to have been a cattle market. In the book Gardens of Pompeii, Anna Maria Ciarella writes, The great importance of viticulture and wine production was not solely due to the popularity of wine being consumed for pleasure. It was an extremely important basic constituent of the so-called medicated wines, which had been steeped with plant essences containing active ingredients. Medicated wines were kept in the home pharmacy as medicine to treat short-lived ailments such as stomach ache, cough, or insomnia. This practice demonstrates how one could arrive in an intuitive manner at knowledge of the extractive capacity of alcohol, even though its nature remained unknown to the ancient Romans. Through investigations at Pompeii, we have not yielded extensive information of the use of wine for medical purposes, but one ancient library on site with papyri still intact, is still be investigated, and a quarter of the ancient city remains unexcavated, meaning that more papyri are likely to be found. The last major figure in the use of wine in the Roman world was Galen. Galen was a physician to four emperors of Rome, but before that, he was the surgeon treating the gladiators. And at the time, human dissection was not widely practiced. So he referred to the terrible wounds of the Colosseum, the terrible battlefield wounds that he treated as windows into the body. And he was a major proponent of wine as medicine, particularly as an anti-infective wound dressing. And remember, the wounds that he was often treating were particularly uh, severe. His legacy was profound, a system of diagnosis and treatment that dominated Western medicine for over a thousand years. Some of his therapeutic formulations of natural products, many if not most of which contained wine, were known as galenicals, and today the term in herbal medicine commonly refers to preparations which contain one or several natural ingredients but pays homage to this medical pioneer. And now let's move along in conclusion in the importance of wine in Christianity and Islam. As the Christian world began to develop from Jewish and Roman antecedents, wine maintained an important role, especially as a symbol. Jesus called himself, quote, the true vine, and his first miracle was turning water into wine. In fact, no other plant is more intimately associated with his life and ministry than wine and the wine grape. At the Last Supper, he declines wine, preferring to wait until he can consume it in the kingdom of his Father. The early accounts of Christianity, such as the New Testament, feature many mentions of wine, but fewer references to the therapeutic uses than the Hebrew texts that I've already mentioned. One famous exception was the parable of the Good Samaritan in the Gospel of St. Luke, in which the Samaritan rescues a traveler beaten by robbers, and he applies olive oil and wine to his wounds. According to physician and wine historian Philip Nori, St. Luke was originally a Greek physician 
and therefore would have known of the efficacy of wine as an, as an antiseptic from the teaching of Hippocrates and possibly Pliny and Dioscorides as well. In the writers as diverse as Herodotus and Omer Khayyam documented the Persians' devotion to wine. Hafez, one of the most beloved of the mystic Persian poets, was born and died in the city of Shiraz, formerly known as Persia's city of wine. He composed poetry on the joys of both love and wine. The Greek soldier philosopher Xenophon, who fought both for and against the Persians, noted that they were well aware of the antiseptic value of wine. Northwest Iran extends into the Caucasus region where winemaking was initially invented. As mentioned, one of the earliest known winemaking sites, Haji Firoz Tepe, lies in this region. Zoroastrianism, the original major religion of Persia, which started around probably 500 BCE, was not opposed to wine. With the rise of Islam and its spread into Persian, the prohibition of alcohol led to many changes in this corner of the cradle of viticulture and brought challenges for the Persian and Arabic physicians. The Quran is contradictory on this point. On the one hand, the holy book says that wine is, quote, the device of the devil and therefore haram, that is forbidden. On the other hand, it notes that wine is, quote, healing for mankind. Now, much of Muslim medicine was learned from Greek and Roman texts written by healers like Galen, who championed the therapeutic use of wine. Famous Muslim healers like Rezis or Avicenna may have tried to steer a middle course by employing wine primarily for external purposes, such as wound dressing. Ironically, the first distillation of wine is believed to have been conducted by the Muslims, possibly by Rezis himself. The process which markedly increases the alcoholic content and made possible the invention of hard liquor. So again, current archaeological research is revealing that many of these early wines, some of these early wines used in religious ceremonies contained other plants or fungi of the gods, like opium, like cannabis that we'll be talking to in a future podcast, and like ergot, a hallucinogenic fungi. So the interrelationship between this plant of the god, wine, and some of these other plants of the gods is still being investigated, still being learned. But to those of us who are students of the history of the plants of the gods, there's no surprises here. Now, more than any other plant or plant product, wine was regarded almost as a panacea in the ancient Mediterranean world. It was employed, as we have seen, as an analgesic, that is a painkiller, an antibiotic, an antidiarrheic, an aphrodisiac, a diuretic, a menstruum, and a sophoripic. Wine was also used to treat anxiety, asthma, cardiac problems, digestive problems, respiratory problems, epilepsy, jaundice, wound, stings, spider bites, and to purify water. Several of these uses appear repeatedly in the historical record, undoubtedly, because we know that they work. We know that wine is highly effective as an antimicrobial, as a painkiller, as a wound disinfectant, and as a water sanitizer. Today, we know that wine, when included as a moderate addition to the diet, as first proclaimed by Hippocrates, can reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease and may help ward off certain cancers as well. Research into wine's health benefit continues, whether as an analysis of a single component, like resveratrol, which we find primarily in red wine, or an examination of the holistic benefits of wine as part of the Mediterranean diet. Now, in conclusion, let me say that when I was growing up in New Orleans in the 50s and 60s, medicine to us consisted primarily of pills and injections offered solely by white men wearing white coats. Fortunately, Western medicine, modern healthcare, increasingly and effectively incorporates traditional modalities like massage, visualization, healing herbs into the system. 
In the age of COVID-19 and political polarization, one ancient medical challenge continues to afflict us in ever-increasing numbers, stress. Western medicine does not have a cure for stress. Socrates, quoted by Xenophon, spoke to this. He said, quote, Wine does in fact moisten the soul and lulls our pains to sleep. It revives our joys just as oil does a flame. So in conclusion, let us return to the wisdom of the ancient past and employ the very first human medicine, that which is a proven stress alleviator and have a glass of wine. Cheers. Let me make a mention of how all of these things connect. As the shamans say, it's all the same thing. We worry about climate change, and of course, a major cause of climate change is deforestation, and most of that deforestation is happening in the tropics. We not only see the forests of the Amazon on fire, we also see the forests of Napa, the vineyards of Napa on fire as well. So ignoring environmental problems in the far off Amazon is coming back to impact us negatively in terms of the best vineyards here in the U.S. of A. But there's another conservation issue about wine that very few people realize. There's many, many different varieties of wine grape that have been made into wine. In fact, the, lotus, the latest statistic I found was that 1,369 known wine grape varieties have been made into wine. But 80% of the wine we drink is made from just 20 varieties. In other words, there are over 1,300 varieties we're not using. And I think this is a real mistake. This is the problem with the capitalist system. We tend to focus on a narrower and narrower base, just like the monocultures in Iowa. And eventually this causes problems because when you're only using a few varieties, it makes them more susceptible to attacks by pests and diseases. And in a world where people want to try different and interesting things, whether it's, you know, Burmese cuisine or uh, other strange restaurants or cropping areas. So I think the same is true as wine as well. But we have to be careful that we're not losing these varieties. At the same time, the wine industry is exploding. We need these things for new and different tastes. We need these varieties to crossbreed with the more popular varieties to enhance their ability to fend off pests and diseases. The bottom line here is that biodiversity has a role to play in benefiting us and our crops and our medicines. This has been Plants of the Gods, Healing, Culture, and Conservation with Dr. Mark Plotkin. Stay tuned for more stories about shamans, hallucinogens, entheogens, unique religious and cultural histories, and rainforest adventures and cures. If you enjoyed this episode, please recommend us to your friends and rate and review on iTunes. To learn more about the mystery and splendor of the Amazon rainforest, find Dr. Plotkin's latest book, The Amazon, What Everyone Needs to Know, on Amazon.com or your local bookstore. If you have any questions about today's episode, direct message us on our Twitter or Instagram at Doc Mark Plotkin or Facebook Plants of the Gods Pod, and the questions will be answered by me. Follow our Facebook page for more information, or check the Amazon Conservation Team webpage, www.amazonteam.org, for more information on our field programs. Excited to hear from you. Thanks for tuning in.